Hello, my name is Dr. Mariana Kriu. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Applied Language Studies at Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth, where I teach a little bit of formal linguistics, but mostly social linguistics. Um, Research-wise, I'm primarily interested in theories of nationalism as they relate to language, colonization, and modernity. And more specifically, I look at past and present forms of Afrikaner nationalism, which I define to include certain forms of contemporary Afrikaner identity politics, and then especially language activism. The first theme that the organizers asked me to say something about is the relationship between language and society in colonial and apartheid South Africa. And I will focus mainly on apartheid, which was, of course, colonization of a special type. And as such, the liberation movement was the movement of decolonization. But apartheid-era politics can also be understood as a conflict of nationalisms, perhaps a civic and an ethnic form of nationalism. On the one hand, you had Afrikaner nationalism, which in, it, in its apartheid format adopted the Fichtean formula that wherever a separate language is found, there a separate nation exists, which has the right to take independent charge of its affairs and to govern itself. It was in this principle that the National Party based not only the Afrikaner claim to the South African state, but also its policy of black homelands. And so that Fichtean principle became a disguise for a language-based divide and rule policy. And in that sense, apartheid linguistics was colonial linguistics par excellence. Um, its opponent, African nationalism, dealt with linguistic differences in its myths by ignoring them. English, English was adopted as a lingua franca and preferred as a language of education. Um, I'm just going to give you a short quote to end this section by A.C. Jordan, 1958, um, his reaction on the apartheid policy of mother tongue education. So Jordan said, in order to achieve their purpose, the Afrikaner nationalists' purpose, the rulers must exploit the universally accepted educational principle that the best way to impart knowledge is to use the pupil's own mother tongue. As educationists, we cannot reject this principle. But as Democrats, we reject the idea of a Bantu community or a colored community, and if a given mother tongue is in such a state that it cannot take the child beyond the confines of the supposed own community, then we must insist that while the child continues to receive training in the use of his or her mother tongue, he or she should also, as early as possible, receive instruction through a language that will ensure them a place in the world community. Hey guys, I'm Benjamin Truter. I'm from the Northwest University Potsdam campus. I'm currently studying LLB. Um, I want to go into business, politics, academia, who knows? Um, the topic today interests me because the complexity of economics, sociology, politics, culture, psychology, education, and how influential language is in it all. Um, specifically also in the development of our nation and all those aspects, because Language has a profound effect on all of those things. And all of those things have a profound effect on the standing of individuals in society. Um, but please feel free to critique. If I misunderstand history, misinterpret it, or just aren't well informed, I am a layman at best. So I'm excited to get this discussion started. Languages form an integral part of South Africa and the history of South Africa, including apartheid. I've chosen to speak about Afrikaans because it is close to my heart and also because of the simple fact that it is a very um, hot topic and also a very profound language in terms of its influence on South Africa. Now just to start I want to give a little um, background on Afrikaans. So the Dutch East India Trading Company was a massive company that brought individuals to the southern tip of the continent of Africa and it had many different workers from many different countries, so they enforced a strict Dutch policy. Now, this Dutch policy bled out to the Khoi and Sun and the locals um, in the southern of the Cape, and many adopted this language. 
and at the end of the day they develop this language multiculturally with many many different people from many different backgrounds using the language and then creating something similar to what we have as Afrikaans today. Um, the first school that I could find was actually a Muslim school called the Madrasa, um, actually founded by a Muslim Indonesian prince called Tuan Guru, which is quite interesting. The first signs that I can see of Afrikaners actually claiming the language um, academically was um, with the start of the Genootskap van Rechte van Afrikaners, Genootskap van Rechte Afrikaners in 1875 committee that was determined to develop the language. By this stage, English had solidified as the speaking language um, above the, the indigenous Dutch because of the English taking over the southern of the Cape. Now, we have to understand as well that many Europeans fled um, Europe from France and from England for the very simple fact of wanting to leave government and its force upon individuals. Now, English was seen as the, that force to a certain extent, and Afrikaans was grasp that, in my estimate, it seems at least, um, because it could be a language that the Afrikaner could claim for himself and develop as he wished. Whether that development and claim was fair or not is a question for another day. As, as I say, it was a multicultural development, and why should it be theirs only? But fact of the matter is, they claimed it and they took it for themselves and developed it. It became a symbol of rebellion against English, and there were great, great battles fought to have it recognized as, as an official language and be used in schooling. So it became a, a symbol of rebellion and a symbol of um, the culture, an integral part of the culture. We can see the same when students marched 15,000 strong against the um, Afrikaans policy in schools um, that would force learners to, to learn in Afrikaans. Um, it had become the language of the oppressor, um, as a matter of fact, and um, many other languages were used to rebel. But why were 15,000 students willing to stand up and say, we don't want to learn Afrikaans? Partly for practicality, partly for philosophy, but I think fundamentally for culture, because language is a fundamentally important part of culture, and throwing it out would mean throwing out culture fundamentally. So I would argue that language has much of the time represented whom the establishment is, and then therefore also whom the oppressed are. Language is symbolically extraordinarily important to cultures for the purposes of identity, and language is influenced by different cultures in profound ways, and in more ways than one would think it connects cultures. And because language is influenced by so many different cultures, and is to a certain extent fundamentally part of culture, it is directly influenced and influences cultures, if that makes sense. Greetings everyone, my name is Carol Mayantino. I am a political science student, also I am the outgoing SRC academic officer. Um, the relationship between the society and um, language is that South Africa is a multilingual society that has a linguistic problem due to the uh, policies of um, apartheid, if I may put it that way. So, the, 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 the Africans and your, educated, your English, they were dominating back then in the apartheid era, you know, between the Britons and the whites and the Boers war and so forth. So hence, it, the, the linguistic problem still exists even now in, in, in our, our living days. I'm going to say a little bit about is the relationship between language and education in colonial and apartheid South Africa. Again focusing um, primarily on apartheid. And I want to say something about two aspects of the National Party policy. The one is the policy of Christian national education for Afrikaners. Um, so the government treated whites as a single entity in politics which was not entirely consistent with its Fichtean approach. Um, it was in the interest of its own survival, that uh, it was in the interest of their own survival, that the Afrikaner nationalists had to tolerate white English speakers in the national territory. However, in the space that really mattered, 
there where the will of the young is bent to the will of the nation, as Kaduri put it. The Anglos were not tolerated, and that is inside the walls of classrooms. So apartheid's mother tongue education project, or what they also called their own schools project, the idea that white Afrikaans and English-speaking children were separated in public schools, separate schools for both groups. That was originally a Bridderbond initiative, and by the Bridder's own admission, one of the most important ones. Um, I'm going to quote Pete Meyer here, who was at the time chairman of the Bridderbond, um, and the relevance will become clear in the next section. Meyer said in 1968, a Christian national education of our Afrikaner youth in and by own mother tongue institutions from kindergarten and primary school to university and other institutions of tertiary education was one of the primary objectives of the Bruderbund from the beginning. Our participation in the establishment of mother tongue schools and the Afrikanerization of our universities is the golden thread that runs through all our activities. Then of course one has to say something about the Bantu Education Act of 1953 which was one of the most oppressive pieces of apartheid legislation and from the outset synonymous with education for inferiority and subservience. Two aspects to the mother tongue, or to the Bantu Education Act um, as it relates to language. It was a mother tongue policy and of course you had the 50-50 policy. Initially mother tongue education and in the higher grades um, English through mediums of Afrikaans and through medium of Afrikaans and English on a 50-50 basis. Now the Bantu education idea backfired badly on Afrikaner nationalists. With the introduction of the system, the apartheid government sowed the seeds of its own destruction. Until 1974, um, Afrikaner nationalists conceded, however reluctantly, that the 50-50 policy was impractical. But then a few things happened. Henny van Sale died, was replaced by um, Geer So, Trienig came into the picture, and the rest is history as we know it. That beautiful poem by uh, Christopher van Wyk, children walk a sea of faces who want to learn anything but Afrikaans. And the interesting thing here is the government capitulated soon, three weeks after um, the, so after 16 June in 1976, they abandoned the 50-50 policy. But the Bruderbonds project continued the whole promotion of Afrikaans as a second language for black people. So, so I believe that language by means of education was used as a tool to try and force us all into homogenous cultures. And Afrikaans was the tool specifically used, and that's why it has such a terrible history, because it was forced upon people. Um, I believe that the NP thought that if they could get everyone speaking Afrikaans and getting taking part in that identity, was as, as the Afrikaner took the Afrikaans language as part of their identity, they thought they could get homogenous thinking and homo homogified thinking there through, um, forcing people to, to think as they did and therefore feed their political ideology and um, mandate. The power of teaching people to speak a language so deeply rooted in culture clearly could have power to help create conformity, which would be very, very um, beneficial to the MPs' aspirations for pol pol political uh, mandates. Fortunately for us, young students forced them to, forced to learn Afrikaans, rejected the idea on the basis of philosophy and practicality. They did not stand for the oppressive two-language policy and were not in the w any way interested in Afrikaans. After all, why should the Afrikaner receive special treatment? Where would the Setswana and Zulu speakers practice their languages and there through their culture? Language is clearly a tool for oppression, debilitation, and indo indoctrination in South Africa, academic spheres and in social spheres, socioeconomic spheres as well. But in the same breath, it represents identity, freedom, power, and rebellion. And thank God it meant the latter for our students protesting forceful use of Afrikaans in schooling. Fundamentally, the MP tried to use it as a tool to stop education. But our students stopped them from doing that at the end of the day. Long down the road. Also, when it comes to the language 
the language and society, also the education system um, back in the apartheid era, their, their, um, their relationship was that um, back then in the apartheid era, we had um, your Africans and Africans dominating to be the medium of instructions in different institutions or higher learning um, educations. Hence, we had your um, the, the Soweto uprising. Hence, we had your um, the, the Soweto uprising, whereby the students were fighting for uh, Bandu uh, education system because they wanted to have um, instead English as a medium of instruction instead of giving Africans as the medium of instruction. Because if you can remember back then, um, students were, were forced. To, to learn Africans in every language, in every subject they were doing in higher um, school or higher education. The final question that the organisers asked us to address is the following. How does the relationship between language, societies and education in the colonial and apartheid times influence our ability to reimagine the use of African languages in higher education and other high status domains of South Africa. So here we're dealing with the legacy of colonial and apartheid linguistics. And I want to focus on um, two aspects and both have to do uh, with Afrikaans language activism. One is the campaign for single medium Afrikaans schools. X model C schools who is reluctant to reduce an English stream um, and want to stay exclusively Afrikaans. The question is what's going on there. The other aspect that I'm looking at is the Afrikaans Must Stay movement, which was a reaction to the Afri Afrikaans Must Fall movement, which was part of the student protests of 2015-2016. Um, what's going on there? The, the campaign to retain Afrikaans as a medium of higher education. And one has to ask, is this not a continuation of that old Brudebont project? Own schools, own institutions. And it becomes more interesting if you look at the, at, at the organizations which brought the court cases against the University of Stellenbosch and Bloemfontein after um, they ruled that Afrikaans would no longer be a medium of tuition. Now, one, these language activists, of course, cite the constitution and their language rights to justify their projects. But I think one must be cautious of an over-optimistic and over-romanticized version of the constitution. That is how Karen van Marle uh, puts it. She adopts the more critical view of the constitution. Um, now of course, our constitution has been hailed as one of the most progressive in the world. But in reality, as Hendricks put it, it was a compromise, not without its costs for the majority. Um, it represents a balance of forces at the time of transition. You won't have to keep this in mind. Um, now, the constitution, of course, created the opportunity for black language activists, activists for African languages, to right historical wrongs through strategic essentialism, to use Pivak's term, by adopting a degree of nationalist essentialism as a temporary political tactic. Because the argument is that the degree of nationalism uh, is necessary or is a precondition for successful bottom-up language promotion. But the white Afrikaans project, I would argue, perpetuates the ethnic, ethnic linguistic essentialism of apartheid, even if it is styled as strategic essentialism. And maybe that is why Afrikaans was destined to fall at some of the historically Afrikaans universities. However paradoxical it is, because we want to include more languages, we want to increase multilingualism, not the opposite. But somehow Afrikaans the legacy of Afrikaans was such that it was a source of division. Um, the heart of the problem may be 
that the constitutional language clause is based on colonial notions of multilingualism. And of course here, um, a very helpful text is Sinfrey McCornian and Alistair Pennycook's notion of disinventing and reconstituting languages. Um, one can also quote in this regard Anna Doimert and Kuleku Mabandla, um, where they say, colonial concepts about language have helped to implement northern ideas of what counts as language across the colonized world. They have established institutions and rituals of education and have led to the lasting marginalization of African ways of speaking, codes, and multilingualisms. Um, now, some of these concepts are native speaker, mother tongue, the existence of boundaries between languages, and the important, importance of school transmitted language standards, of standard languages. Um, Charlene Dias, in another article, um, also includes the term language shift and language death as outdated concepts and colonial concepts. Um, Marconi and Pennycook at even more terms, language rights, mother tongue education, code switching, all of these have become problematic. And the reason is, and here I'm quoting Marconi and Pennycook, that they reproduce the same concept of language that underlies all mainstream linguistic thought. And that is the concept of multilingualism as a plural, pluralization of monolingualism. And perhaps the most problematic concept, perhaps the most serious problem, is the idea of a standard language. Um, we know the standardization of African languages involved epistemicide, revoicing the colonial other, um, as Chris Stout put it, silencing their histories and distorting their cosmologies. So the, whole, the standard language ideology has become particularly problematic in our time. Let me conclude by, I, I, think, I think you're all familiar with that, but by just referring to the work of Charlene Dias and Bassi Antia, because I think it's one of the most important or most, most interesting projects that is happening at the moment. What they do is to translate part of the lecture, lecture material not only into standard Afrikaans and Isikosa, but also into COPS and to urban the urban variety of um, Isikosa and Cape Town, thereby acknowledging the idea that the standard language may be an alien language to some students. Language is power, to put it simply. And to say that the rationale in empirical sciences are far above language is a falsity, yet this is how it is treated. And for what reason? Is it because language is a deeply emotional yet rational science as well? Is it because it is deeply confrontational and asks questions that we don't like to ask ourselves because it confronts the self to articulate his own thoughts and what he believes to be true? If psychology is to describe the human experience or condition and from what it springs, language is certainly to understand and live the experience. It is the power to unite and bring together cultures, yet can also destroy them. The Tower of Babylon is a clear indication of the power of language that even biblical text sees. The Son of God himself was killed for the misuse or so claimed misuse by the Pharisees. We clearly do not care enough for language, nor do we care enough for our dialects that are indigenous to South Africa. The blame can be put upon the apartheid government, but not solely, for or even if they played a massive part, which they did, and most of the part, I would say. Our current government has failed miserably at putting in enough effort to really raise the grassroots levels of indigenous languages. Where are all the influ influential African writers? Is there only Dalian Matia and Breiten Breidenbach? Is there no great Zulu writer? Why have these diamonds not been uncovered and been made widely available to be appreciated? Or is it the simple fault of the nation not interested in academic indigenous languages? Shall we all feed ourselves with the British English language? Have we not empowered ourselves? Where are all our self-formed committees to develop our languages as Afrikaans did? Do we lack responsibility for our own cultures and languages? My ignorance on the subject may have caused me to digress. To make, it makes me unaware of possible coalitions for indigenous languages, 
but on its surface value, it seems to me that this should be of great concern. It must be said that these are also more questions than answers. I am a layman on the subject, as mentioned earlier. But from what I have seen, it seems to me that there are a multitude of problems, from government to leadership to personal responsibility for our own languages. Reimagining in South Africa will not be run by government. Cultures that seek to maintain who they are will have to seek and develop and fund their organizations by themselves, and I hope that they do, for a corrupted government is quite frankly not going to do the job, even if it may help the cause it stages. What I will say lastly of the hot topic that is Afrikaans is that reimagining empowers indigenous languages and does not take away from them, as Afrikaans is also an indigenous language. The attack on Afrikaans is warranted given the historic connotations, but to destroy the language is to destroy a culture, likely cultures, rather than learn from them, use their methods, create similar empowering organizations such as we see in Afrikaans, we attack them. We need to rather protect and develop more cultures. Don't try and destroy as the apartheid government once did build. Once did. Build and something beautiful may come from the rubble, but the destruction of Afrikaans will not lead to this. It will only disenfranchise more people in this country, and in the name of what? Creation of another pile of battered bricks? Vengeance or retribution, maybe? A language represents far more than that of the apartheid government. It is a deeply important part of a tradition and heritage, to connecting us to those who came before us and those who will come after. To destroy such deeply profound connection, rather than creating others, seems foolish to me. I hope that we are wiser than this, but what I do know is that I am but a layman. But maybe, just maybe, there may be truth in my hypothesis. How much still seeks to be ascertained. It is important to develop what we have, to keep what we have, and to build on what we want for the future. And that is what I would say we have to do for the future of language. We should not remove we should empower. How are the languages from the apartheid era now affecting um, us in higher institution? Is that if you can remember well, um, back in apartheid era, students were made to believe that um, uh, English, you are intelligent if you speak English fluently. You see. So now it is affecting us to implement African languages in higher institutions because there's this there's this stigma that when you speak English you are still you are still uh, you are intelligent but when you speak your African languages you then not, you are then not showing uh, intelligence. So also um, if you can look at the academic writings, there's only few academic writings that are written in African languages. So it's going to be so hard to implement um, Af uh, African languages in, 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 in higher institutions unless we then develop a um, lot of academic writings that students can use. But however, if there's a certain module that has and, 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 and a lot of academic writings that are written already in African languages. So I do not then see a problem of why um, the, the, the why the higher institution doesn't um, implement um, African language other languages in their institutions. Um, thank you very much. I am Dr. Chris Holdridge. I'm a senior lecturer in history at Northwest University's Mafeking campus. I am an historian of the 19th century British Empire, especially settler colonialism in South Africa and Australia, and teach world history and historiography. Now, I believe it is important to enter conversa conversations such as this session by laying on the table my biography and identity. Now, I'm a white English speaking South African born and raised in Cape Town with degrees from the University of Cape Town and a doctorate from the University of Sydney in Australia. Now, as a teenager 20 years ago, I was not presented with the opportunity to learn an African language in high school. The only option for second language was Afrikaans. I think this is telling itself of the politics of language and education in our country. I'm thus functionally monolingual with only a smattering of Afrikaans to get me by alongside English. <laughs> 
I'm also not an expert in language, but an historian. But as an historian, I hope my comments here would at least open up some debate. My answer here is confined mostly to the 19th century, which was a foundational period for the politics of knowledge around which language came to cohere to the colonial project in southern Africa. Now, one has to venture close to the Houses of Parliament in Cape Town, to the heart of legislative governance in our country, to a statue upon a tall plinth in the company gardens, Southern Access, in front of the National Library of South Africa. Now, the statue I refer to is not that of Cecil John Rhodes, which still stands further north, but that of George Gray, former governor of the Cape Colony from 1854 to 1861. Gray's collection of books and ethnographic material formed the basis of our national library. His collections comprise not only of Africana, but also materials related to Maori oral tradition and Australian Aboriginal uh, tradition. Um, for Gray had served previously as governor of South Australia and then uh, New Zealand. At first, the library was combined with the South African Museum, now to the north of the company gardens, but then was stuffed wildlife under the same roof as manuscripts recording the languages of the British Empire's indigenous peoples. Taxidermy and indigenous language sat side, side by side as artifacts, objects of inquiry to be studied. The primitive versus the modern, civilized versus uncivilized. This is all part of the mindset and assumptions of settler colonialism, even that of uh, so-called liberal humanitarians of the time, such as Gray. George Gray's collection of language materials, and thus that that's foundational to our National Library, are founded upon an assumption that African and Maori languages and customs, those of peoples who required European governance and tutelage or oversight, to, in George Gray's words, rise step by step to the pinnacle of civilization. Now, George Gray's librarian, the German Wilhelm Bleck, even coined the term Bantu and proceeded in one of his projects to preserve what was seen as the language and folklore of a dying race or races, uh, the San. Now, historians and especially anthropologists have long been aware of their complicity in this racist ideological project as their professions emerged into university departments at the turn of the 20th century. Now, obviously, they've, they've rectified this in scholarship since, uh, but this, um, these departments, university departments, were built in part in the early 20th century on the work of Gray, Bleak and others. Uh, this was also a project not only of English-speaking figures and institutions, but also of Africana uh, higher education. The logics of white supremacy marked African languages as definable, knowable, um, through European eyes, eyes that emphasized separateness and difference. Now, Afrikaner nationalists would justify European-defined distinctions between Amazulu or Basutu languages and cultures to legislate uh, segregation as policy. Now, this was not Gray's 19th century vision of preserving languages of so-called dying races, but an equally racist uh, assumption and use uh, based on European claims to knowledge of African languages and culture to justify the creation of homelands. Uh, through development, with development of the 20th century in many ways, uh, having similar meanings uh, in intellectual trajectories as uh, 19th century civilization. Now, my point here is that we need to be aware of the foundations of our own libraries and institutions of higher learning back into the 19th century to begin to consider what a decolonial approach to language might look like. Good day, everyone. My name is Rajen Mistri. I'm a professor of linguistics at UCT, where I have taught since 1986 for the last 34 years. And as of January this year, uh, without knowing about COVID, I elected to uh, retire formally from teaching and administration to concentrate on research. So I hold an NRF research chair, which uh, I uh, will, uh, indulge myself in research this year and for the next two years on the themes of sociolinguistics in South Africa with special reference to uh, migration, language 
communities and social change. So let me talk on the first theme, and that is the relationship between languages and societies in colonial and apartheid South Africa. As you know, the apartheid period doesn't extend very far back, only as far back as 1948. And prior to that, uh, the colonial period in South Africa roughly goes back to firstly uh, the early 18th century, um, 1820 being the date when there's a large scale settlement of the English. But prior to that, of course, uh, the settlement of uh, Dutch of the Dutch in the Cape goes back to about 1652. Now, uh, these were turbulent times. Uh, colonization brought about a kind of clash of cultures, uh, and not just about uh, uh, culture, but of course politics and the ownership of the land. These are very complicated matters. So let's start briefly to answer the question with the Cape uh, in the 17th century. Uh, so uh, prior to the arrival of Dutch, uh, the Cape was more or less Khoisan territory with many languages belonging to the Khoi and San uh, groupings. These are several groupings, not just one family. Uh, and they would have been uh, relatively uh, small scale. Uh, but that kind of uh, social order and sociolinguistic order was heavily tampered with after the arrival of the Dutch settlement from 1652 onwards and with the arrival of slaves from the east, mostly from Indonesia and even coastal India. Although they came to be eventually called Malays, they really were from different parts of Indonesia, India, uh, Madagascar, and even uh, a few shiploads of sla slaves from East and West Africa. So the Cape has always been a melting pot of a society. The slaves influenced the local Khoisan and vice versa, and they both influenced the ruling Dutch classes as well. So much so that the Dutch language got transformed in the Cape into what was eventually to be accepted as Afrikaans. So uh, there was major societal transformation for the Dutch in this period as well. Uh, and the formation of Afrikaans remains, I think, a, a very uh, important and interesting part of our uh, social fabric and our linguistic fabric. In other parts, uh, prior to the arrival of the English and the trekking of the Dutch away from the Cape into first Natal and then into uh, what later became the Transvaal and Orange Free State, uh, Bantu languages and culture were very strong and the societies were quite cohesive in the pre-English uh, or pre-British era. Um, and it would have been more or less taken for granted that uh, there's a unity between local groupings, let's say Amazulu, uh, Amaklasa and so on, local groupings and languages. At the edges, however, languages uh, and cultures always merge. So while there is a coherence to a notion of Zulu culture, Xhosa culture, Sutu culture, etc., uh, these are not uh, absolutely binding. They can change. And at the edges, at the borders, they are quite flexible. British rule was to um, really, again, uh, tamper with this relative cohesiveness uh, so that uh, there was a realization that uh, in the new dispensation, the African indigenous language was important, but so too was a knowledge of English uh, especially, and, and Afrikaans um, as well. Um, and the English themselves that came from... Uh, mostly um, southern parts of Britain, 
of Britain, but also perhaps from the Yorkshire area in the northeast. Uh, that too is, is an interesting story as part of our social fabric. Uh, but the political kind of uh, way this was played out is that we talk in linguistics about uh, colonial multilingualism or colonial bilingualism, where there's an expectation by colonists in the history of the world, whether they be the Romans who colonized half of Europe or the British who colonized half the world so that the sun would never set on their empire. It would always be sun, there would always be sunlight on some part of the British empire at any time of day. Uh, this certainly created an expectation that for formal, bureaucratic, administrative purposes, the language of record keeping and officialdom would be English, but that at a practical level, of course, indigenous languages, whether they be in India or in Africa, would continue to be important. Um, so we have to keep in mind uh, the fact, really, of colonial bilingualism throughout the world. Now, it was on mission stations that former slave descendants, indigenous Khoisan and African peoples uh, learned to read and write, with literacy rates higher than those even uh, in the 19th century of rural Afrikaners. It was also on mission stations that the first printed newspapers and books in Southern African languages were printed, authored not only by white missionaries, but black intellectuals such as Tio Soga and John Tengo Jabavu, the latter the editor of Imvu Zabansundu, African Opinion, founded in 1884. Although African language texts were first published for the spread of Christianity, they would by the turn of the 20th century become increasingly important for African political organization and the emergence of black intellectuals who formed the core of the founding of the ANC and other anti-colonial organizations. Now, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking about language and education in colonial South Africa as a battle for dominance between English and Dutch or later Afrikaans. Uh, although anglicization policies since the 1820s indeed emphasized English as the lingua franca or main language in law, governance, education, Dutch was not entirely displaced and still continued as a medium of communication. This is ever more so following the South African War of 1899 to 1902, where the settler colonial compact or agreement between Boer and Britain meant a dual combined recognition of Dutch, later Afrikaans and English, after Union in 1910 a focus on Afrikaans versus English, and the attendant nationalism tied to the former, especially, I think, is a bit of a red herring and a distraction. In the scheme of power, I think it mattered little to the majority uh, black population whether English or Afrikaans would dominate in educational politics. Segregation would continue no matter which of these languages uh, were used African languages, when considered worthy of, of knowing by white South Africans in the er, particularly early 20th century and as the decades progressed, was always in a position of power and normalizing of racial divisions. Young white students entering university learning African languages, uh, they did so to become uh, native commissioners or officials in the Department of Native Affairs under the Union of Apartheid governments or a smattering of an African language uh, might be seen to facilitate a master-servant relationship, uh, a mining engineer speaking to a black labourer, for example. Language and its status in education uh, preserved the racial or racist uh, status quo. African languages were rarely afforded space as a medium of instruction given equal weight or value uh, by the 20th century South African state. And we see this very callously uh, play out later in the 20th century with the enforcing of Afrikaans language instruction in the 1970s, culminating in the student uprising in 1976. Now, I want to make two points very briefly here. If we could rewrite the wrongs in the past and, and travel back and rewrite the script of history, it would be a major mistake to allocate 
separate language education as a means of decolonial justice. Now, this would further enforce difference upon which racist policies were established. A second point is that although um, orality or uh, spoken word is indeed important, a long history of underfunded and low output of printed African language literature has placed English and Afrikaans as the standard bearers of what counts as South African literature and thus uh, one of the crucial mediums for the imagining of who we are as a nation. The Lovedale Press in the Eastern Cape, which still exists today, and where many of the first African language works were published in Southern Africa in the 1800s, is under threat of closure currently through a lack of funding. Now, in understanding education and language in our country, we need to consider ways in which this history can be emancipatory. One means is to rediscover, republish, uh, and to fund African language poetry and literature as part of the canon that we teach and we read, and that makes us South African. We come to part three, which is a brief reflection on languages and education in the colonial stroke apartheid eras. Uh, one thing we must keep in mind is that education for the masses, uh, kind of education for everyone, is not a very old uh, phenomenon. Even in Europe, in Britain, and places like that, uh, this is mostly well into the 20th century that education starts to become truly democratic and the opening up of schools uh, for the ordinary citizen and not just the aristocracy and the those who are well off. Uh, in colonial South Africa, education truly was not much to boast about for the um, majority of our population. Uh, even if we think about the history of universities and so on, right? There were no universities in South Africa until about 1840. Okay, so we need to keep that perspective in mind uh, when we have expectations of what can be done in education, what was done and what wasn't done. In the colonial era, um, education was left largely to the hands of missionaries. And in the mission schools, which blossomed especially in the Eastern Cape, uh, we think of Lovedale as a kind of wonderful example, um, education was multilingual. There was a favoring of English as the language of um, aspiration and formal education, but African languages featured uh, quite heavily too for at least um, six years. It obviously varied from uh, one mission station to another. The mission schools also, without bias, without prejudice, taught Latin and Greek, and so there were people of Xhosa background who were very fluent in Latin and Greek and English, and were major writers in uh, Isiklosa as well. Uh, the thing about mission education is it has a good reputation, it is supposed to be good, but the truth is, with hindsight, we would say it was elitist in the sense that it only catered for small numbers of people and the majority of people were left without an education. And this is one thing that we should be ashamed of in our colonial past in South Africa, that people were getting rich in the 19th century, in the gold and diamond fields from 1860s onwards, but that uh, money wasn't plowed into starting a good education to build a future. It is a great cause of regret that we are facing problems now that really should have been worked on from the 1860s onwards. So come the apartheid era of the 1948 onwards and the Afrikaans segment of South Africa manages to wrest power away from the English and so they win elections and so there is a quite vigorous uh, policy uh, to favour Afrikaans over English. 
Uh, one of the many things to be ashamed of was that the Afrikaans government um, closed down mission education to a large extent. Okay, so this was a time when other schools were set up, but they were very much in the hands of uh, apartheid ideology. Uh, and uh, in the apartheid era, we moved from colonial bilingualism to colonial trilingualism. They created space for African languages, not perhaps entirely out of the goodness of their heart, but more as a kind of divide and rule policy so that Sutu would be separated from Zulu, from Kosa, etc., etc. And uh, there was always opposition to having to deal not just with English as a new language, but English and Afrikaans. But uh, in the 50s, with the likes of Trirnicht and so on, uh, there was a hard line taken, and that is people refused to listen to the pleas of parents who were saying, uh, we don't want Afrikaans as medium of instruction, we'll have it as a language to be learned, but uh, really we would rather have English. But there was also opposition to uh, an African language being kept on for too long as a medium of instruction. So there's always been a movement towards English seen as a language of education uh, and internationalization. Um, but when uh, things got worse in terms of this policy in the 70s, the youth of South Africa protested largely. We ought to all know, and we celebrate this on Youth Day, the Soweto uprisings of 1976 when young school children took to the streets protesting largely about the prevailing conditions for black people in the country. They also protested, by the way, about the kind of um, lackadaisical nature of some of the older generation who were sort of taken to uh, the beer halls and not really fighting for their rights. Uh, but the main cause was, in fact, people were opposed to Afrikaans. It wasn't only about the Afrikaans language, however. It was very much about uh, problems in the making since even pre-apartheid, i.e. colonial times. And so since 1976, Afrikaans has taken a backseat in African education in South Africa. So come the 1990s, uh, with the ANC now coming a little more into the open, being unbanned, the initial deliberations of the ANC were largely in English because they had many of them had been in exile in other parts of Africa, India, Europe. Uh, they had an international outlook which favoured English. And I think reading between the lines, come 1993, when language uh, policies uh, uh, were in the air, uh, the ANC would largely have gone for a policy of English as the sole official language. However, uh, there was opposition from the Afrikaans communities who mobilized and drew in uh, the idea of multilingualism and drew in other communities as well. And so the ANC had to concede that actually maybe its thinking was premature on this and it kind of decided to go the other direction and to make not just English and Afrikaans the official languages, but to have uh, the nine uh, large African languages, indigenous languages as official too. And so that kind of closes the uh, outlook and the practice of the apartheid era. It ushered in a phase of official multilingualism. I've been asked to respond to how the relationship between languages, societies and education in our history might influence how we could reimagine the use of African languages in higher education. But there is the initial problem in our, in our use as societies, as, as a word. Uh, what, is, what is meant by this? Uh, societies could imply separateness or groups, whether Zulu, Swana, White and English. And these are the very categories that formed the logic of apartheid 
and the knowledge systems that propped up white supremacy and ethno-linguistic nationalism. Now we make a major category mis mistake when we accord too much weight to language in defining our identities as separate. I thus think it's vital that we do not fall into the trap of uh, cultural nationalism through language in ways that further entrench difference. This is the problem potentially with Afrikaans only, English only, or even imagining Swana only classes in a South African university. How do we understand each other and form social cohesion if we separate according to our languages in separate lecture theatres without conversations between all students? Now what is far better is some level of multilingual spaces for education. We could perhaps make an African language module compulsory for all first year students. Could perhaps also create space for students to use an African word or phrase or concept in the classroom. Separate English, Setswana and Afrikaans, can be a recipe um, in university education for entrenching such difference. Because students then aren't brought into conversation with each other, difference, that is the idea of separate Zuluness or Afrikaaniness or Swananess tied to language, was the logic of colonialism and apartheid and its abhorrent racism. Now the answers to this question of how to address this um, and the language issue in higher education are complex. And I think the experts on contemporary language policy and, uh, are better placed to comment on this. But I think it's a conversation that we all need to enter into, not just academics, but members of the public, students. At the centre of the conversation, we need to imagine what it is that we wish our university students and citizens to be in a future South Africa through a decolonial project. Language is a tool to draw a line between each other and to separate uh, our perceived differences uh, can reinforce the structures of power and racial inequality in post-apartheid South Africa. Now, a decolonial university should start at least by recognizing African voices and African languages, not as a separate mode of instruction, but as part of a multilingual conversation. We need to do more to recover the canon of African language poems, historical sources, philosophies, narratives, and literatures, and integrate them into the Afrikaans and English knowledges so long dominant in our higher education institutions. In this final part, I wish to briefly reflect on reimagining language in post-apartheid South Africa away from the constraints of the past. Uh, nevertheless, I want to begin by saying, uh, by noting that English has increased in South Africa. In my observation, uh, English has firmly, uh, South Africa has firmly become an English-speaking nation, not, not a solely English-speaking nation by any means, but a, an English-speaking multilingual nation much more than, let's say, two decades ago. And people are uh, confidently and proudly using English in many contexts, but by no means all contexts. That is important. And I think this is an absolute gain that we would, this is a resource both locally, uh, continentally in our continent, as well as globally. And it is a resource that we should not treat lightly or throw away. Here, let me give you two quick examples of countries that are absolutely struggling to kickstart English. The poor Koreans uh, are an extremely diligent, hardworking nation, uh, very inventive in various spheres, but they really struggle to have good access to English. So much so that parents break up their families and middle-class parents send their children all over the place to Cape Town, Johannesburg, even to Potchef Stroom to go and live out there, learn English because you don't learn English easily. You learn English by interacting and so on. And that is something that we, we needn't do in South Africa. Likewise, in Namibia, when I look at students from Namibia and I discuss things with them, I realize how hard it is to kickstart a good knowledge of English in the education system when there are so few speakers around and not that many models to emulate. 
Um, likewise, the current COVID crisis has shown us how important communication is, and at the highest echelons, indeed, it is English that has kept us in touch with each other and uh, across communities in South Africa, with Africa, and importantly, with the news coming in from Johns Hopkins University, CNN, and the like. So let's not throw English um, out of the picture. However, South Africa has never been an English-only country, and as we know, we should respect and bring to the fore the other uh, 10 uh, official languages. But let's not get carried away with official them. The sign language as well. They are heritage languages of migrants. Shona is a big language of this country now. Uh, there are many communities from different parts of the world who, who love their language and would love to propagate them too. Uh, f where African languages are concerned, I would suggest that we do need to make uh, the study of them more attractive than appears to be the case. Uh, young people especially complain of alienation from what is taught in the schools as being too deep, too rural, too 19th century, too missionary. Uh, so we need to think about materials, and this is where young people themselves must come to the fore. Young people are fantastic at playing games with languages. They do this all the time when they use sotsital and skamto and things like that. And we shouldn't. Uh, we should think creatively about these uh, forms of slang. We should also think uh, creatively about the urban varieties of language. In the late 20th and early 21st century, uh, the languages are no longer kept in apartheid-like fashion. Uh, the townships of South Africa are highly multilingual. Language use is flexible. There's code switching, crossing of language boundaries. And somehow this excitement has to come into uh, the classroom. It can only come into the classroom if people start creatively writing poetry in this way or short stories or short sketches in this way so that young people have material that they can enjoy all right so i think uh, that's one uh, lesson uh, coming in from all over the world it's a much more fluid dispensation for languages these days we shouldn't think of uh, keeping languages rigorously separate now, if there's a school teacher in the audience, you might say that's easier said than done. Um, and indeed, I, I, I don't want to preach on this theme, but this is something that we need to think about, that the formal side of education can indeed look at formal English and formal Isizulu or whatever, but there should be room for creative multilingual spaces in the classroom. Um, likewise, even Afrikaans, which you know has had a complex history in this country, should has already, I believe, opened up to acknowledge that it needs to uh, draw upon the uh, practices of coloured people who have been marginalised heavily in the past, but who's uh, who bring to bear this level of creativity, i.e., in refusing to keep Afrikaans separate from English. Uh, they have uh, created kind of fluid code-switched varieties, uh, mixed varieties called carps in Cape Town. Um, again, I'm not sure how they can be drawn upon at the most formal level, but they are absolutely uh, resources to play around in liter literature classes, uh, to encourage poetry or the reading of poetry that is coming out in carps, uh, short stories, and even to attempt one's own short compositions in multilingual speak, um, if I may use that term. We got to break the stranglehold of people who are preaching and teaching from missionary 19th century norms in the classrooms. Really. We have to find ways of making um, the languages appealing to the children uh, so that there isn't an abandonment of the languages in the formal sectors. Now, there isn't an abandonment of the languages in the homes. Uh, 
on the streets, and even in the COVID crisis, while formal communication, our president in his mask speaks 99.9% .9 of the time in English, at lower echelons, I am assured that people, uh, volunteers, uh, people who uh, volunteer for the community police forums and so on, safety and security councils, all uh, emphasize that they, in order to bring the disease and the crisis to a meaningful level, that they have to use our local languages, they have to be creative about them, to have to develop vocabulary side by side with the people they speak to who can understand. Uh, so that is a way that our languages are not a luxury. Uh, they are absolute necessity for survival, but they must go beyond survival. They, they belong to uh, the education systems, they must be enjoyed in primary school and in high school. And if the educationists demonstrate this to, to my satisfaction, um, I will concede that they can be used in higher education too but for the time being more as multilingual resources and tools to aid and abet uh, the kind of formal English of the universities or Afrikaans of some universities. Uh, but I myself am not convinced that translation, academic translation of formal science from one language to another is as easy as people make out it is a that would be a long term project